Sorry. Okay. Um, hello. Today I'm going to share a story called When You Pass Through the Waters. What a delightful time I spent in Zambia. Really, I had not even planned to go there, but the airport told me to go there because it was an emergency. While I was there, a person told me that he has a story at his house that I would really like to read. But he said that he couldn't give it to me, but he would mail it. Sure enough, a few weeks later, it went in the mail. It is such a good story that I want you to read it. It tells of something that happened in the Zambezi River. That is a very big river. I saw it. So there was a pastor who lived in Labanda, and he had to go to um, some town called Limalunja. I can't pronounce it, but anyway, he had to go there, and it was a long ways away. And he had to go there so that he could buy some sugar and flour. And they had a very good vegetable garden. They, they were good people. They paid their tithe. And, but they had very little money left at their home. And they couldn't afford very much food. So, but they needed food, so he had to go across the river so that they could um, get some ingredients so that they could make some food. So, um... He went to the river, and he got into the canoe with his bicycle and crossed the river. And so he got all his shopping done and got all the ingredients. And then about at 5.30 p.m., he started to ride home on his bike. He arrived at the river at about 7.30 p.m., but unfortunately, it was getting dark. He put his bicycle in the canoe with the packets of sugar and flour tied onto the bicycle carrier. And um, the sugar and flour um, carton were, was made of paper, like the packages they were in. Um, so anyway, he took off his shoes and tied them onto the bicycle. And he had his trousers rolled up to his knees. His shirt and other clothes were still on, though. So when he, but then when he paddled halfway across the river, his canoe tipped over and he fell into the deep water of the mighty Zambezi River. His bicycle and the load of sugar and flour sank down, down with the canoe. The life of our friend was now in danger. He struggled to swim, his clothes getting heavier and heavier with the water. He felt he was losing power, but then he remembered um, that Isaiah 43, 2 says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep you. He struggled on, coming at last to a grass island that felt solid under his feet. He realized that Jesus had protected him, and he felt secure in the hands of Jesus. Despite his waterlogged clothes and the crocodiles, neither of these could prevail against him. Surely God's promises were being fulfilled to his faithful child. Now that he was on the island, another difficulty faced him. How could he get off the island? island and get to the other side. Looking about, he noticed a long black um, object, which at first he thought to be a large crocodile, but on further investigation, he found it to be a canoe. Wondering whether someone else on the island needed it, <laughs> he felt that he needed to use it. So he left his bicycle in the carton of sugar flour at the well, like, they had fallen into the river, so he didn't have those with him. And his wife did not know what had happened, but thought that he might have left late from Lima Lunja, and that he was still on the way home. She trusted in God and never lost her confidence. She called all her children to pay, pray for their father, who was still coming home in the darkness. About 10 o'clock p.m., the pastor... Hi. Um knocked on the door with his clothes still damp and without his bicycle. Where's the bicycle? asked one of his kids. Oh no, the bicycle will sleep with the crocodiles, my son, replied the father. What happened? asked his wife. God is there in heaven, said his beer reply. Come and tell us, um, and get some dry clothes on, she urged. 
So after putting on some dry clothes, he um he said thanks for God for saving his life and getting him home. And even though he had lost all those groceries and he had lost um his bicycle, God had saved him. And thank you for listening. So in the lesson of this story is God is always there for us, and you can call on him for help if you need it. You can go back to your seat. Thank you, Abby. At this time, the Ganson family is going to have our special music. Oh, thank you. Special music doesn't get any better than that. All righty. Our scripture this morning is taken from Ephesians 4, verses 13 and 14. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the statute of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. At this time, Matt will have our service. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. It is an absolute blessing to be here in Enderby this morning. Uh, 
I apologize. Uh, the Lord has had us quite busy over the last six weeks in a row, uh, preaching in other churches, trying to uh, help God's people understand what the important focus is for our time. So get my computer open here. I want to look at this Ephesians verse, these verses a little closer. Let's start in 12, Ephesians 4.12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Who's the body of Christ? We are. We're God's church. We're God's people. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and by cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking... The, the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So, brothers and sisters, our job is to unify. Unity. Now, there's a unity, there's a version of unity being pitched to the world right now. But the unity we're looking for is unity in what? In Christ, in truth, in truth. That's the important piece. The unity can't just be unity for the sake of unity, but it has to be unity in the truth's sake. Otherwise, Jesus said, be ye separate, separate. And so in this, do you guys have my, um, is it all queued up? Let's try sliding it over so it's actually there. That would be helpful. Thank you, brother. The title of the sermon today is Decoding Project 2025. By a show of hands, who here has heard of Project 2025? Some have and some haven't. When I go around the churches, I find that it's about 20 to 30 percent of Adventists understand what Project 2025 is. But if you've ever heard any of my sermons, you know I talk an awful lot about dragon, beast, and false prophet. All of this is to try to help us understand that the Bible is true, that the Adventist understanding of prophetic interpretation is correct, and as we see these things unfold in the world, what is it supposed to do? It's supposed to help us come closer to Christ, to realize that the biggest battle we have in this whole thing isn't the papacy, isn't the dragon beast or false prophet, it's our own selves. Brothers and sisters, it's our own selves. It's our own wicked and deceitful hearts. It's the battle with sin. Now, are these elements something we need to be aware of? Absolutely. And there are a number of other pastors that are much better than I am and other speakers much better than I am at talking about the nature of our role with sin and the victory that we must have over sin through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? But as God has put into my heart, my goal and my job here is to just educate I've been educated through Adventism. I wasn't an Adventist, as many of you know. And I learned a specific way of presenting this message. And so as I give it, please forgive me if it's not something that resonates with you, but it's something that resonates with me, and I put these together so I can help other people who also might resonate with this type of information. And in fact, I... Um, I did for Amazing Discoveries, a camp meeting, I did a presentation where I laid out the main areas where Satan is going to attack us in the end. We can't just be casual Christians, brothers and sisters, because God allowed us to live in a time where being a casual Christian is no longer an option. You have to be an engaged Christian, and what I mean by that is we have to understand the doctrines of our faith and understand when people push at them how to not only to defend them, but to break down the walls of where the errors are in the other views in Christianity and Protestants, Catholicism. And so what I did is I tried to do the best I can to, to break out the places where we're going to get pushed against the most. And I'm offering this to anybody who would like it. It's a PDF. This is not uh, what I'm going to be doing today. It's a separate presentation, but I want to offer it to you freely because it lays out questions, common objections, uh, proof texts that tackle each one of these things. Now, it's not a perfect uh, grouping of, of information by any means, but what it's supposed to be is a baseline that will help you build your own studies in preparation for what is coming. 
So if you'd like this, see me at the end, and I will give you my email address, and I'll make sure that as, if you email me, I'll make sure you get this document. One of the things that God's people are supposed to do at the end of time is not just supposed to sit in church and listen to sermons, but we actually have an active duty. Ezekiel 33, 7 says, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee as what? A watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, thou shalt hear the words at my mouth and do what? Warn them from me. So oftentimes I hear, stop talking about all this negative stuff. Uh, that's not the love of Jesus. But who here is a parent? Who has children here? Can I see a show of hands? Is it a, a sign of love when you warn your children of something that could endanger them? It most absolutely is. In fact, I've just got a little two-and-a-half-year-old over here, and I'm having to warn her of scissors and watch out for tripping over this, and every single warning I give her is because I don't want her to get hurt. I don't want her to, to fall over or injure herself, and how much more so when it involves our very souls. The job that we have, in part, is to give the warning out of love. It says in Ephesians 4.15, but speaking the truth in love. So this also tells us that in our warning message, we can't be out there judging. There's a difference between judging people and warning people. Amen? Amen. We're not sitting on our high horses saying we are better than you because we keep the law and we keep the Sabbath and we do this. That's not what the, this is about. We all realize our situation in the eyes of God. We're all sinners. We all fall short. Amen? And without the free gift of Jesus Christ, we don't even have the privilege to come to him and take on this role and responsibility that we have. So this warning that we give is out of truth and mostly out of love. We love our brothers and sisters. And as somebody who is sitting on the other side, a non-Bible believer, somebody who didn't believe any of this, there are those out there who will believe if we approach them and they feel the love that we have for them. So gentleness, tenderness, kindness, compassion, all this can be done within giving this warning message. Now, what is the message of warning that we're supposed to give? Revelation 14, 9 through 12 gives us the three angels' messages, but specifically this third angel that says, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive the, his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Do we want even our worst enemies to drink of this cup of the full wrath of God? If you say yes, then we need to look at our, examine our hearts, because Christ does not want that either. We should want every soul, even if his name is Justin Trudeau, who's not a popular figure right now, but do we want him to be saved? I hope so. I hope we're all taking time to pray for him, because I'd rather see him in heaven with all of you than have a, another soul lost to Satan's kingdom. And as we're getting ready for the end, we need to be ready to cultivate this type of mindset because, brothers and sisters, it's coming, and it's coming very, very fast. What we're going to look at today is going to show us exactly what we should be expecting to see, but the devil has set up so many snares that it's clouding our ability to see through it and see what's really important and what that's happening in Israel and Palestine and in the United States, how it's all connected to the Bible prophecy that we understand. Sister White says, the voice of a true watchman needs now to be heard all along the line, for we are in the great day of the Lord's preparation. Now, this is important because if we're not spending our time now preparing for what's coming and we have all this information and all this freedom to worship and freedom to study and we don't use it, are we going to be ready when the day of preparation is over and, and the, the war is on? We won't. We need to take this time to be ready. She says, we may struggle as, mighty, as a mighty man in swimming against the current of Niagara. Does that sound difficult? It's, it sounds like a situation I, I would not want to be in. But we shall fail unless the Lord pleads on our behalf. The other mindset we have is we do nothing of ourselves. So as we give this warning message, again, it's not in judgment, for everything we do will fail unless we do it, asking God for help along the way. Without him, we can do nothing. We also have a, a role. It's not just sitting in our sins and saying, well, God's going to save me from everything. In fact, in, in a lot of Protestant denominations, there's something they call the age of grace. Has anyone heard the age of grace? It's essentially... Uh, the idea that once you're saved, you can continue on sinning endlessly without consequence because Jesus paid for all those sins. 
but we call that the age of cheap grace. What God has asked us to do is what Sister White says here. They must be pure. They must be divested of self, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And in our job, our safeguard for this crisis is what? It's the Word of God. Answering with a thus saith the Lord. This is what will alleviate or soothe some of the persecution because when we answer with a thus saith the Lord in the face of persecution, and they still persecute us. Are they persecuting us or are they persecuting Jesus? So we want to remove ourselves from the equation because if we put ourselves in the midst of this, we're going to be absolutely destroyed. And the three powers that the Bible tells us to watch out for are dragon, beast, false prophet. It is very, very clear that these are the three entities that the Bible and Sister White point to as the entities that we need to watch out for in the end. Who is the dragon? Okay, and the beast, and the false prophet. American apostate Protestantism. You know, I, I hear in, in a lot of times when I ask this, these questions, I hear a loud answer on dragon, Satan. I heard a loud answer on beast, papacy. But for some reason, it gets very quiet when we get to American apostate Protestantism. Like we don't really want to accept that this is the power that we need to be watching out for right now. But I want to share something with you, and I may have shared it in the past, but it's really to reiterate how serious this is and where the focus is to be for this time. It says, I'll start in the highlighted part. Then I saw the mother of harlots, that the mother was not the daughters, but separate and distinct from them. She has had her day, and it is what? In the past, in the past, and her daughters, the Protestant sects, were the next to come on the stage and act out the same mind that the mother had when she persecuted the saints. I saw that the mother has been declining in power and the daughters have been growing in power. And soon they will exercise the power once exercised by the mother. Are the Protestant churches going around and persecuting like Rome did during the 1260 years today? Not yet, not yet. So, if we're looking at where we are in the stream of time, has Protestantism done what it's going to do, or are we expecting that to be the next major player that we should be focused on? And here, most of the world is saying, look at Israel, look at what's happening with, between uh, Islam and Judaism, and here, the Bible and Sister White are telling us that the Protestants will act out the same mind of, as the mother, and quite honestly, this is hard for me to fathom. It's hard for me to think that the Protestant churches will show the same spirit, but Revelation 13 tells us that's exactly what she's going to do. She tells us the power, the Bible tells us the power that has two horns like a lamb and spake as a dragon, it's going to exercise all the power of the first beast. That's a given. We know that that's going to happen. And when it does, it's going to get everyone to worship the first beast. So as we're looking around the world, we should be dead set on where the Bible tells us our compass should be. As America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy in forcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. So where does all this happen first? The UN, the papacy, uh, Israel, Palestine, or America? America. You can't have the rest of the world following America's example if they do it first. So it has to be America. And so as we're looking at these things, we need to just keep our attention focused on the Protestant power in America because the devil is setting out many winds of doctrine right now, and it's meant to confuse and to deceive. And we should be expecting this because the number one attribute that is describing Satan's plan time and time again is deception. Deception. It says so again in Revelation 13, excuse me, and he makes great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men and deceives them that dwell on earth by means of those miracles which we have talked about at length in the past, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. It's these miracles that give it momentum to make the image which allows the deadly wound to be healed, the wound by the sword, and yet it does live. It says, Satan will work his miracles to deceive. He will set up his power as supreme. So, again, this is giving us a timeline 
He says, uh, the, the verse here, or the passage here says, he will work miracles. Does that mean that it's already done, or is this something that's to come? It's coming down the line. And then she says, he will set up his power as supreme. We've talked about Satan appearing, pretending to be Christ. It looks like the second coming as it happened. It looks like the millennium's beginning. And he set up his power as supreme. And I want you to notice the very next line here. The church may, be, may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. So the reason I put this in here is because I want us to realize the state of the church and how late in the game that it looks like this. Because I've heard of people leaving Adventism because they don't like the way things are going within leadership. Does anybody know anybody that feels that way? Because I've heard many, many times that this is the case. But as Adventists, we already know there's a shaking coming, don't we? And we know that all this comes right as the end of time, as the flow of events at the end of time occurs. We know the church is about to look like it's about to fall, but it does not. So brothers and sisters, if you are God's people and we have a warning message to give to the world, should we leave the church if we don't like the way leadership is going? Absolutely not. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Just look at the ancient Israelites and the relationship that they had with God. Was it a perfect relationship? It certainly wasn't. They had more wicked kings than they had righteous kings. Yet at no time in ancient Israel's history was there ever another place to find the true God of heaven. That in fact, if you were abiding to God's law and following after him despite the kingdom, you were one of the pillars that kept the truth going. So as we know that the, this late in the game, that it looks like the church has appeared to fall, don't be discouraged, brothers and sisters, if our church continues to go through a shaking in fact, we need to stay in it to rebuild the walls, to repair the breach. That is our job. That's our job. And if we leave, all it's going to do is lead us away from the truth, just as if we left the ancient Israelites and thought we started something new and great, some offshoot of Judaism at the time. It's only going to lead you further and further away. It says, none but those who have been overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony will be found with the loyal and the true without spot or stain of sin, sin without guile in their mouths. So brothers and sisters, it's not just being an Adventist that saves, but it's living by the word of your testimony and over overcoming by the blood of the Lamb. That can occur within Adventism, and you can stay and be strong, be a pillar in the times where it looks like the church is about to fall. Don't be one of those that leaves and encourage those who have left to look again at these verses, at scripture, at Sister White's writings to realize that we already know this is going to occur, to not be shaken by it. So we saw in that Ephesians 4.14 verse three primary attributes that Satan's going to use to deceive the whole world because there's one thing he wants more than anything. What is it? He wants your worship. He wants your worship. And more than anything, rather than he wants the world's worship, he wants those who are considered the remnants worship. So those who are sitting and honoring the Sabbath, keeping God's holy day through faith, he wants your worship. And he's given us, the Bible's given us the three main tactics. It says, don't be carried about to and fro by every wind of doctrine. So doctrine's gonna be one piece. By the slight of men, I put in here peer pressure. And at the start of 2020 with the, the crisis, did we see peer pressure as part of the, the program? We sure did. And if we thought that peer pressure was intense, that you could lose your job over the personal choice you made based on your own conscience, wait till we see as the worship elements come in. It's going to get more and more. The third piece, it says cunning craftiness, and I've, I've put in illusions here. We know that Satan's going to use what look like miracles to deceive the whole world and to make it look like Protestantism is the real truth tellers in this whole story. And he's going to use these three things so he can get your worship. Jesus told us in Matthew 24, 4, take heed that no man deceive you. So there's no reason for us to be unaware of these pieces. Now, America needs to form this image. 
And, and Sister White tells us, in order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government. The religious power needs to control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. So this is the, the crux of the whole matter. We should be looking at not just Protestantism, but their influence on the civil government in the United States. Now, I have shown in other presentations that seven of nine Supreme Court justices are Roman Catholic. And they are, over the last several years, taking a wrecking ball to the wall separating church and state. It says, Supreme Court testing church-state barriers. In a series of recent rulings, the court has sided against policies based on the premise of secularism. It says the Supreme Court is taking a wrecking ball to the wall between church and state. And what's a wrecking ball do? demolishes everything in its path. Now, there are two aspects of this separation of church and state within the United States. There's the aspect of um, public funds going to private religious institutions in the form of schools. And then you have this rule against coercion. That is, you can't be forced to attend or to participate in a religious ceremony if you don't want to. But let's see what it says, as recently as August 13th, what it says about these two pieces of this separation of church and state. The establishment clause was long understood to require strict separation of church and state and to specifically forbid using public funds to pay for religious instruction. But those days are what? Long past. So if you've got a building and it's standing on two pillars, you've just went and knocked one of the legs out from under this, this principle of separation of church and state, and it hasn't even just recently happened. It's been long in the process that this principle has been put in the past. It says, that leaves the rule against coercion, which does still seem to have a little life left in it. Now, when I think about a little bit of life, this is going to be a bad analogy, but I used to play video games, and you get these power meters on your guy, and it'd go down and down and down, and I imagine that meter's right about here. One or two more good hits, and it's completely gone. What does that mean when it's gone? It says, even Gorsuch appears to concede, for example, that the government may not send the police to arrest someone who refuses to attend a Catholic mass or find a Lutheran who refuses to convert to evangelical Christianity. I think those are fascinating examples that they give because... Christianity in the forms of evangelical and Catholic ideologies are the mixture that we're looking to occur. And here they're saying, yes, there's a little bit of life left in it. You can't force someone to do that. But once this is gone, you'll be able to force someone to attend a Catholic mass or find a Lutheran who doesn't want to convert to evangelical Christianity. Is this the type of thing we should be expecting to see at this stage in the game? It's exactly what it, it should be at this stage. Now, this is where... Project 2025 comes in. And we're going to peek inside of this document. It's a 900-page comprehensive guide on various aspects of the U.S. government and its functions. It involves a broad coalition of over 70 conservative organizations that come together aiming to prepare for and seize opportunities within the U.S. government in preparation for the transition to a conservative, religiously focused Republican government. The goal is to assemble a group of aligned, vetted, trained, and prepared conservatives to work from day one to deconstruct the administrative state. Now, do you see the purpose of this? Why is 2025 a big deal? Well, because next year, there's a presidential election in the United States in 2024. And whoever wins that election, they'll take office at the beginning of 2025. The goal here is from the Republican conservative religious view that this is a, this 900-page document is the comprehensive guide of what they're going to do once they win this election in 2025. And we see that it's to create a religiously focused Republican government. Interesting. This is from their homepage on their website. It says, it's not enough for conservatives to win elections. If we're going to rescue the country from the grip of the radical left. Now, what we're looking at today is going to be the Hegelian idea of left and right. Do we know what Hegelianism is? It's essentially putting two opposing ideologies out into the world, pushing them against each other to create friction, which ultimately leads to a synthesis. 
And what I contend and what we'll be looking at today is that most of what we've seen in this ultra-liberal agenda has been to give fuel and support to the ultra-conservative side that's coming right behind it. And you see this here in the language on their own webpage. It says, if we're going to rescue the country from the grip of the radical left. So these are, are in essence, our saviors from the evil, bad leftists. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not pro-left or pro-right. Let me just, I'm pro-God. I'm pro-Jesus Christ. That's right, Naomi. This, the, this is the goal of the 2025 presidential transition project. So they're going to save us from the left, and they say we need a governing agenda with the right people in place. Now, it says 70 conservative religious organizations were part of this, and the reason I, I put this up here is because it's not like we're looking at just one group that put out a paper, and, and this is their thoughts and feelings. In fact, the 70 groups that came together are some of the most powerful and influential think tanks in the United States. And this might actually be seen as one of the most um, unified efforts to make the United States government a Christian government. And the reason that these organizations have come together in agreement where in the past they may have been opposed on things is because the radical left has become so bad that they see that they need unity in order to make this transition happen. Now, if the 70 entities that put this document together are all on a bus, who's driving that bus? And that's where a group called the Heritage Foundation comes in. Now, I've had Adventists come up to me after some of these that I've given and said, well, I actually get mail from the Heritage Foundation. Uh, are, are they really such bad guys? I'm not here to judge. I'm just simply pointing to the information and the reality of the situation. So uh, if you're getting Heritage information, you can come talk to me afterwards and we can talk a little bit more. But they said themselves that they are America's premier conservative think tank. And they were established by three gentlemen in 1973 as a response to the perceived liberal bias, liberal is left, in policymaking in academia. So the reason Heritage Foundation was even created was to have this conservative religious voice in the face of liberal policymaking. Does that make sense? When I look into these organizations, I always want to know when they started and who started them. So let's take a look. Paul Weyrich, Catholic, Edwin Fulner Catholic, and Joseph Kors Evangelical. So we see the merging of Catholic and Evangelical ideologies are occurring within these conservative think tanks. It says, Way Rich, he was known for his efforts to mobilize the religious right and was instrumental in the formation of the Moral Majority, a political organization that sought to advance conservative Christian values. Now when this says conservative Christian values and Way Rich, Way Rich is a Catholic, what definition of Christian values are we using? Catholic. We're using Catholic definitions. Fulner, trained and educated in Jesuit schooling, and Coors was the conservative evangelical who believed in the importance of traditional values. And you're going to hear this more and more and more as we get closer to these things unfolding. Needing traditional values. When I think what we're aiming for is not traditional values, but biblical values, regardless of tradition. Now, that was 1973. The question is, who runs it today? Who runs Heritage Foundation today? And it's a guy named Kevin Roberts. Uh, the previous one was a Southern Baptist, which is considered an evangelical. And so you'll see that the leadership trades off kind of between evangelical and Catholic, evangelical and Catholic. And right now, we have a evangelical, uh, excuse me, a Catholic running it, a guy named Kevin Roberts. And I want to share with you a clip just to show that if you're in these positions as the head of think tanks and you're putting out documents like this, are you able to separate your beliefs from the work you put out? Absolutely not. I think it's impossible for someone to completely separate their beliefs from the work they produce. Let's hear a little bit from Kevin Roberts. And I don't know if this sound's going to work, so maybe, can, yeah. Can. But a reinforcement of our Catholic values, and from that reinforcement, courage. And I think that's one of the things that, whether it's in chapter meetings or the annual summit, or equally importantly, the friendships that we have developed, just the courage, especially with the way politics and culture and society are, for us to go through that, to confront those challenges, and to be cheerful about it. So, head of the Heritage Foundation is saying that his work is about the reinforcement of Catholic values. So, when you look at a document like Project 2025, 
and it's headed by the Heritage Foundation, who's headed by a Roman Catholic, who says, I'm here to instill and reinforce the ideas of, of Catholicism. What positions do you think Project 2025 holds? Catholic positions. And the evangelicals are all ready to accept it. Says Heritage President Kevin Roberts, the golden era of American conservatism will soon emerge. Now this was stunning to me because for most of America's history, you look at the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, that's what would normally be considered the golden age of American conservatism. And that we have blown past that long ago when we've been living in this age of increasingly liberal ideologies. But here they're saying American conservatism is about to go through its golden era. That's fascinating. And when you see in the, the um, highlighted part of the article, it says, but as a hopeful prescription on how the conservative movement led by organizations like Heritage can emerge from a turbulent time even stronger and in position to take back the country from the radical left. This is the ideology behind this document. They need to save us and rescue us from this radical left ideology. It says, but if history is our guide, then we have every reason to believe that the golden era of American conservatism will soon emerge. Does that match with our view of end time prophecy? Absolutely. We also expect there to be an emergence of American conservatism. So now let's peek inside of this document a bit. On page 48, it says, the office should be engaged early and often. So this is if they win the election, the Republicans win the election, this is the steps that they're going to take as soon as they get in. The office should be engaged early and often in using government contracts to push back against woke policies in corporate America. Now, the term woke is just another word for ultra-left liberal ideologies. And what you're going to find when you peek in this document is you have a world that's barreling towards the left and a what looks like an emergence of the right. And I just wanted to kind of lay this out as a, as a way for us to easily see what the differences look like. Left liberal, right conservative. The left is pitching a version of communism through technocracy, which we'll get into in another uh, sermon, which is the role Elon Musk is playing, bringing in technology to observe, surveil, and control every aspect of life. That's communism. The right is pitch, uh, pitching a version of democracy but I put it in quotation marks because it's not the true republic democracy that, we, uh, that America was founded on. One side's woke, the other side traditional. One side anti-God, so then the prescription is obviously the right side, which is God, right? We need God, but not if it's forced God. Does that make sense? Imagine having an anti-God world, and everyone says, okay, we need God back in everything, and it turns out to be the papacy again during the 1260, a forced God mindset. Is that any worse than anti-God? In fact, in some cases, it might actually be worse than anti-God because forced God, as we saw, leads to that 1260 years where they literally invented devices to compel people against their conscience. The left side preaches globalism, the right, nationalism. And I gave some organizations to try to make it more tangible so the left side would look like the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, events like COP27 and COP28 that's coming up. And the other side is National Association of Evangelicals, the Heritage Foundation, and literally uh, dozens more that I could mention here. So I want to stop for a second because we see that the document is kind of promoting this anti-woke, anti-communism, anti-globalist agenda. And it's headed by Catholics and was created mostly by Catholics. Well, around the same time this Project 2025 document came out, something called Laudato Si 2.0 also came out. Did anybody hear about Laudato Si 2.0? It's actually called Laudate Diem. And uh, it's only an 18-page document. It's actually rather small. It's a supplemental piece to the much larger encyclical Laudato Si. And it says, let us unite... So the, the, the purpose of these documents is to unite. Let us unite with our Christian brothers and sisters in the commitment to care for creation as a sacred gift of the creator. Well, we, could, we can agree on that. We must side with the victims of environmental and climate injustice. Well, there's where we have a separation. Because this, the environmental and climate injustice I would replace, we, are, we must side with the victims of those who have sinned against God. The injustice isn't against the climate, it's against God. And they're changing the focus to the object rather than the one who created the object. 
working to put an end to the senseless war against our common home. And you'll see this time and time again when dealing with the current setup of the papacy. The common home, the common good, all these things are the exact opposite of what we'd call Bill of Rights, personal liberties, personal privacies. Commonality, common good, and individual rights and liberties cannot mix together. Because while the common good says you can have individual rights and liberties, they're only up to and subject to that of the common good. Does that make sense? So you, you seem like you have these individual rights and liberties until you hit that threshold and then you do not. Where something like the Bill of Rights establishes the individual as supreme over the common good because they honor the conscience or your ability to choose and think for yourselves over that of the greater perceived good. So when we peek inside Laudate DM, what we find is, in my opinion, one of the most non-religious documents the Holy See has ever put out. It, in fact, reads as like a scientific literature journal. And I want to show you an example of that. It says, we know that every time, we know, being a statement of fact as if everyone agrees to this, we know that every time the global temperature increases by 0.5 degrees Celsius, the intensity and frequency of great rains and floods increase. Is that true? Well, a whole other talk could be done about that. Skip down. It says, the Paris Agreement presents a broad and ambitious objective to keep the increase of average global temperatures to under 2 degrees Celsius res with respect to pre-industrial levels. I'm not going to go into why that's a ridiculous statement. And with the aim of decreasing them to 1.5 degrees. Work is still underway to consolidate concrete procedures for monitoring. So does this sound like a religious document to you? In fact, what they've done is they've given us these arbitrary ranges, these thresholds that give an illusion that there's some standard that must be met. But the standard is arbitrary and irrelevant in the greater scheme as it just acts as a means to control individuals and businesses to adhere to impossible, what they define as sustainable global goals. And we'll look at what that means more in a second. Now, who knows who this man is? John Kerry. John Kerry is interesting because he ran against George Bush Jr. And during the process, they were both interviewed by the same man. And the man asked them if they were both Skull and Bones members. And they admitted that they were. So you had, in the setup of democracy with the freedom of choice, you've got two choices, both from the same secret society. I just found that fascinating. And John Kerry has been um, tasked with heading the climate envoy in the United States, meaning he goes and does what Al Gore used to do, goes around campaigning for drastic and radical climate change sweeping initiatives. Now, he's met with the Pope four times over this since he's been put in the, in the head of the envoy. And I want you guys to see if he is preaching from the same script as we saw from Laudate DM. Emissions from the food system alone are projected to cause another half a degree of warming by mid-century on the current course that we are today. And instead of being on a course to be able to hold the nurse temperature increase to 1.5 degrees, we're actually on a course to hit around three degrees right now. And you just can't continue to both warm the planet while also expecting to feed it doesn't work. And as is so often the case with respect to the climate crisis, we have to fight on multiple fronts simultaneously. This is the biggest organizational effort that I think we have faced, uh, certainly since World War II, but perhaps ever. So we have to reduce emissions from the food system to keep the 1.5 degrees alive. Why do we have to keep 1.5 degrees alive? Because scientists, as a basis of physics and mathematics, not ideology and politics or party labels or anything else, as a matter of physics and mathematics and some biology and chemistry have told us, these are the consequences. Did he get the same script? Is the exact same temperature goals, and what he's saying is, it's our fault, this whole climate change thing. It's man-made activity. It's a result of man-made activity. And part of the problem is we're growing too much food. So in order to be sustainable, we got to cut food production. Well, what's that do? That creates food shortages. The Bible talks about famines. 
So we see here that the concept that the climate change left woke, what they call it, agenda, is focused on this climate issue is a central piece of the whole thing. And we see that they say it's human activity. It says the unusual rapidity of dangerous climate changes is attributed to unchecked human intervention on nature in the past two centuries. Skip down to the bottom, it says, these changes are attributed to the global imbalances causing the planet's warming. So it's our fault, all you carbon emitters. How dare you? I want, what's that? Yeah, I don't think so. But I want to show you something. This document we looked at, what Carrie just said, these are all from October 2023. Who here has heard of the Club of Rome? It's a think tank that used to be in Rome, and now it's in Switzerland. They released a book in 1991 called The First Global Revolution. And in it, I want to read you something from 1991. In searching for a new enemy to do what? Unite us. We, the Club of Rome, came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine, and the like would fit the bill. 1991. In their totality, in the interactions, these phenomena do constitute a common threat which demands the solidarity of all people. Now, here Carrie is up there saying, you can't have, this is not ideology, this is science. Didn't we just hear that in 2020? Don't argue with science. This isn't about ideology. Well, it absolutely is. It says, but in designating them as enemy, we fall into the trap about which we were already warned, namely mistaking symptoms for causes. All these dangers are caused by human intervention, and it is only through changed attitudes and behaviors that they can be overcome. Brothers and sisters, has this thing been in planned in play for a long, long time? Are the... In, in 1960. Yeah. So th what we're seeing today is a manifestation of something that's been in play for a long, long time. And when I said it sets us up for failure, well, let's just take a look at what these things coming off the page and turning into tangible, actionable human behavior, what does that look like? It says all of you with stoves that work and heat that work in your homes, you have to cut all this out and keep cutting until we get rid. The number one goal says no poverty anywhere, any place on earth. Jesus says the poor will be with you always. No poverty ever. Get rid of everything you have until, and that's good until it's achieved. And Jesus saying, it's always going to be with you. So what is, what do these goals actually end up doing? They make everybody Poor. The second one says zero hunger. Give everything up until there's no hunger left. The third one says good health and well-being. And when you click on that box and open it, it says defines good health and well-being as getting your regular shot treatments. I don't know how else to say it because I don't want to say the, the other word. But the bottom line is this is what the ultra-liberal left agenda looks like right now. So let's go back to this Project 2025 document, because this is where the Hegelianism is happening. You have the papacy and most of the world pushing this leftist ideology, but here, this group in the United States, nationalism, this right-wing conservative religious movement, has released this document, and look what it says about climate change. The next conservative administration should rescind all climate policies from its foreign aid programs, shut down the agency's offices, programs, and directives designed to advance the Paris Climate Agreement. Well, that's the exact opposite. We, we just heard from John Kerry, exact opposite what Laudé Diem said. Let's see again. It says the agency should cease collaborating with and funding progressive foundations, corporations, international institutions, and NGOs, non-governmental organizations, that advocate on behalf of climate, what? Fanaticism. I caught myself, I had to stop myself being like, yeah, finally somebody gets it. I, I'm starting to agree with this document. And this is the nature of deception, brothers and sisters. This is the danger, right? The, the other side is so bad that you're waiting for the real bad guy. You're actually rooting for them and asking them to come in and take over. It says, finally, the next administration will face a significant challenge in unwinding policies and procedures that are used to advance radical gender, racial, and equity initiatives under the banner of science. 
So this is going exactly in the face of what we're experiencing right now. Similarly, the Biden administration's climate fanaticism will need a whole of government unwinding. As for the f other federal departments and agencies, the Biden administration leveraging of the federal government's resources to further the woke agenda should be reversed and scrubbed from all policy manuals. As it says in the last two words, it's their top priority. Well, this is crazy because here the Pope says one thing and Catholic run organization says completely another. It's talking out of two sides of its mouth. So what's the real goal here? I mean, even in this document, it's anti-World Health Organization, anti-World Economic Forum. It says, the manifest failure and corruption of the World Health Organization during the COVID-19 pandemic is an example of the danger that international organizations pose to US citizens and its interests. I kind of wanted to say when I read that, amen. But we have to stop ourselves, brothers and sisters, and look at what's really important to Satan. He wants your worship. And this is part one of a two-parter. So next time, I think it may be December 30th, Bruce and I were talking about. I'll do part two here. Because what we talked about today is how they're different. And when you break it down, you'll see you have communism on one side, which I believe, you know, it's very clear that the, the papacy and this pope is lifting up that version of, of government versus a conservative revival. You have one side saying, yes, climate change. The other side said, get rid of all of it. One side says, yes, more global organizations. The other side says, get rid of all of it. But where they're the same are the most important pieces for God's people to be aware of. They're the same on moving the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Who remembers Donald Trump made that move? In the face of 70 years of uh, political uh, understanding, Tel Aviv was the place because... Jerusalem was off, off the table. Well, that move was uh, radically important in understanding what the false prophet wants. We also see that in the document is support for Israel, and the reason being is the evangelical view of the flow of end-time events, which involves a rebuilding of a third temple, an antichrist arising, an unidentified antichrist rising in the future. All of this needs to take place in Israel. And the last piece, the document, Project 2025, actually talks about Sabbath rest. And it defaults Sabbath, guess which day? <gasps> Sunday. What a surprise. So in this next one, we're going to look at these last three pieces and try to understand what the role of the false prophet is in all this. Because if we look at what's happening in the world through that lens, I think all of it comes very clear into picture. We know that the false prophet wants to do what? They want united church and state. And I have video clips I'll show in the next one that show the new house speaker saying as much. They also want, evangelicals want this third temple to be rebuilt. So as we're looking through all the noise of what's happening, brothers and sisters, watch these two pieces come into play. We see Trump recognizes Jerusalem as Israel's capital and orders U.S. Embassy to move there. On Wednesday, this was uh, several years ago, 2017, Trump formally recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, reversing nearly seven decades of American foreign policy and setting into motion a plan to move the United States Embassy from Tel Aviv to the fiercely contested Holy City. And what's crazy is, in the evangelical world in the United States, they have made Trump a messianic figure. They are even putting out articles who said who had it worse during their persecutions, Trump or Jesus Christ? And in fact, this picture that was drawn isn't to say, well, Jesus was with Trump uh, going through his trials with him. It's to say that Trump had the equal experience of persecution that Jesus did in going through trials. What a ridiculous notion. So brethren, I want to just help us the best I can keep focused on the war that's really coming. There are those in the Christian world that are saying, you're going to need your swords. You're going to need armor. And I just want to change that thinking as we close out here today. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And we're going to look at the type of armor that we need. And I want you to help me. It says, you need your loins girt about with a breastplate of feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of the shield of, helmet of, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Brothers and sisters, this is our battle. This is our weapon. Our obedience to His principles 
are what protect us, not any device of physical warfare. So brothers and sisters, I encourage you to come back on December 30th to see how this all wraps up, to see how the new, the new uh, House Speaker in the United States, Mike Johnson, is a hardcore evangelical who has introduced a finance package to Israel with the sole goal of bringing about the false prophet's view of end time events and what role Donald Trump and some of these other characters play in where they're different and where they're the same and why where they're the same is what Satan's most interested in, in your worship. I thank you for allowing me to share today. If you would just quickly bow your heads with me in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, you've asked us to unify, and I want that unity amongst your people so badly. I see so much division. I see so many winds of doctrine. But Lord, we don't want a single part of unity unless it's in the whole truth. And we know that your son is worthy to receive all things. You've told us that we need to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So give us this spirit, Lord, that we might go forth and turn away from our sins, but also preach the good news of your soon coming and what's needed for all of us to receive you on that glorious day. Thank you for my brothers and sisters here for hearing this message and allowing me to share it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll open our hymnal to 294, the power in the blood. Please stand. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Father, you have shown us that it is only those who overcome by the power of the blood. And Father, I just ask for that power to be within all our hearts and minds, that we might go forth today and, and shine as a great light amongst a darkening world. Lord, please let us have this continence of peace, of joy, of hope that others see and just want so badly and that we give freely as you have given to us. So Father, please bless our fellowship meal today and please give us all the spirit that would glorify you as we move forward in this week. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> 